for those of you who do not know me, my name is Mimi Young, and I am one of the pediatric ophthalmologists and chief of the service. Um, and today we are going to be presenting a few cases. Um, I'm going to start here. Um, so this is a case that I have seen over the last couple of months and um, has many things that I'd like to talk about and present to you for a little bit of discussion. So this is a 58-year-old, very pleasant gentleman who showed up to my clinic with some progressive diplopia. Um, and uh, the tech came out of the room and said, and he's a neurologist. <laughs> and I thought, oh, perfect. Um um, but his, he was very pleasant, um, just, you know, very detailed description of his diplopia and his symptoms, um, and had come to me actually by way of neuro-ophthalmology, um, because he was a neurologist and he self-referred and noticed that he was having some diplopia. Um, and they did a scan and, uh, discovered an incidental schwannoma on his left fourth nerve here. Not very big, but looks like it, you know, likely was the cause of his symptoms. And so um, you can also see here, I mean, well, back here you can see our little lesion here. Um, and you can also see that the superior oblique muscle here looks just a little bit smaller maybe than on this side. Sometimes those cuts are a little bit hard, but um, I think you can, you know, maybe appreciate that. This one is a little, this left side here is a little less thick than it is on the right. So when he first came to see me, you know, his vision was great. He was a little bit myopic, um, but really noticed his double and down gaze. And um, he also is a, a fair amount of his job is looking at a microscope. And that was making things difficult for him because when he looked down, um, he was he was getting more double and it was he was finding himself closing one eye a lot. Um, he could, you know, his stereo depended on kind of where he was looking. He had, um, a fair amount of, um, excyclotorsion here. It looks like he actually had a little bit more in primary gaze, but, um, all those things go with a fourth nerve palsy, you know, with a superior oblique muscle that is no longer in in the eye. So you start getting some excyclotorsion. Um, uh, on exam, he had just a little bit of a hypertropia that was a little bit worse in down gaze, but really not, you know, not, not too much, but he, um, he was pretty bothered by his symptoms and likely due to that X cyclotorsion, as you know, that muscle is mostly a cyclotorter. And so, um, you know, bringing that together was making things difficult. He did have a little bit of a chin down to keep himself in up gaze. Um, but he wasn't, you know, so bothered by it. He, um, we gave him a Fresnel prism that he, you know, was going to use some of the time, um, but he wanted to just wait because he could deal with the symptoms, but wanted to just check in with us. A year later, he came back and said he felt like his symptoms were stable, um, but he was, you know, didn't feel like things were getting better and wanted to talk about maybe doing something about it. So on exam, he was a little bit more in primary gaze, but, um, and quite a bit more in down gaze. Um, which you do so much looking down, you walk, you read, you, um, so when you have trouble in down gaze, <laughs> you look in a microscope um, and he's worse over here, which correlates with this superior oblique muscle not working. So I put a little bit of uh, base down prism in there. I was trying, you know, my big question here was, what kind of surgery am I going to do? How am I going to fix this? It's pretty hard to fix something that's only in one position of gaze because you run the risk of making things a lot worse in primary. Um, and for somebody, you know, this is also a case where he was a neurologist and he had many thoughts about his symptoms and what was going on and how to fix it and um, made me think a, a, a little bit more about it. Um, but I, you know, was wondering if there's any way I could build this number up more. Um, and that, that may help a little bit with my surgical planning. Because if I could make, you know, if he was controlling a lot of it here, um, then, you know, and I could build this up more, I would feel better about doing, you know, a surgery on the, on a, the right inferior, inferior rectus muscle. 
So I added a little bit of prism. If he was in a two, I put in a four and just to see if I could build him up a little bit. I got him up to a six, which isn't much more, you know, still a 10 and down gaze. Why isn't it a 12? Well, it probably depends on exactly where you're holding it when these, when these, you know, holding his head. Um, these are so position dependent. Um, I really didn't feel, you know, that he had that much more inferior oblique overaction. So usually the superior oblique and the inferior oblique are pretty well balanced. Um, so when you look to the side, things stay pretty straight. If your superior oblique isn't working much, sometimes your inferior oblique will start overworking. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't really see that in him. Here are his pictures. Um, you can see that he's looks pretty straight in primary. Um, we're talking about a left um, superior oblique palsy here. So uh, when he looks over to this side here, you can see that it doesn't pull the eye down and in as much. And this is really the position of gaze, you know, gaze that we look at the most. But he's got, you know, maybe if you draw a line here, there's a little bit more inferior oblique overaction here, but. He also seems to have a little bit over elevation here too. So I wasn't so, you know, didn't appreciate much inferior oblique overaction. He definitely seems to have a little bit of an esotropia and far down gaze. Um, and this eye certainly seems to go down further than this one does. So, um, you know, every time he came in, it was a long visit because he wanted to talk about it and explain, you know, uh, you know, ask many questions. He also had a big trip coming up where he was going on a bike trip. And so um, that kind of influenced, you know, how I thought about his case as well. Um, I also, you know, ran it past one of my mentors at uh, Boston Children's, who's always been great to me about uh, even 12 years after my fellowship, helping me um, figure out what to see, what to do on this surgery. Um, and um, so what was I thinking about? So there are three, you know, possible thing, you know, several different surgeries. You've got two eyes and you, you know, they work together. So you're always just trying to get them to work together a little bit better. And it's always a little bit tricky when you have a paralytic, you know, process. How, how do you make that better? Um, you know, and oftentimes it's by weakening the other side to help balance it. So um, you could, you know, in his case, you could do, you know, what we call a Fodden procedure, you know, we don't want to change his, his, his alignment too much in primary gaze. What we want to do is change it in down gaze. And how do we do that without screwing up primary gaze? And that's always kind of tricky, especially in somebody who overthinks the situation and, and is, you know, very analytical. Um, so uh, a Fodden procedure is where you put a permanent suture, usually kind of a Mersaline, a non-absorbable suture. Um, you know, you don't, this is the insertion of the muscle. You don't, this, you don't change this. You just add some suture here and it really kind of just changes the, 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 the pull vector of the eye and makes it so you would do this on the in, on the uh, opposite inferior rectus to make it so it didn't pull down so much and it would make it so he didn't have so much of a hypertrophy and down gaze. Um, more recently, they, uh, you know, many years ago, Alan Scott kind of talked about doing a recess plus resect procedure. So a, a surgery where you uh, you know, you take a piece out of a muscle and then move it back um, to kind of create a little bit of the same Fodden type procedure. And more recently, they've done kind of a series looking more closely at this and have pretty good success with um, dealing with small numbers of patients, small numbers of, well, they looked at the small number of patients, but just small misalignment in, in, in primary gaze and more in down gaze. So uh, these are patients that had, you know, smaller, a variety of different things, and it, it tended to work well for these, like my patient fourth nerve palsies, not as well for the horizontal palsies, but um, where they had small misalignment and then, um, more misalignment in, in a different position of gaze. These are different pathologies, but, um, and these are the, uh, results. So, um, what they would do would be do like a, for, this is a superior oblique palsy where they recessed an inferior rectus, they resect the muscle four millimeters and recess it and, um, you know, have a much, uh, reduced incompetence in down gaze. So this is something else that I thought about doing. I haven't done too many of these kind of ran up past some of my colleagues here who had limited experience with it, but this is another way that you can restrict your 
your movement in one in one uh, position of gaze. Um, you know, a lot of times we like to do things on an adjustable suture so we can fine tune it later, but the inferior rectus is one muscle that's really tricky to do on an, an adjustable suture. So if you resect it, it's even trickier. Why? Because the gravity pulls you back the other way. So it has a tendency to have a late overcorrection. So um, these are all things to consider when you're considering doing a FODN or what was this called, a you know, a resect, resect procedure on the same line. Um, the other thing you could do would be a superior oblique tuck. So, um, what is that? That's where you're actually taking this, you know, it goes against a little bit of what we talk about, cause this is a paralytic process, a paralytic pathology, and we're just tightening a paralytic muscle, which does tend to work in, in this. Um, and when you're talking about, um, a double vision that is mostly from t torsion in down gaze, this can sometimes be the best one to do. So, um, this is what we call a tendon tucker. This is a superior oblique muscle that they we've pulled up. And then uh, um, actually this is, I stole this. There's a great video here on um, from Monty Del Monte about doing a superior oblique tuck, but you pull this up and then put a suture through here uh, just to kind of tuck it up. And how much you tuck it is pretty tricky. Um, yeah, it depends on the laxity of the tendon, but also depends on your, your uh, and Dave's gonna talk a little bit more about this, but um, how high you can move the eye afterwards and comparing it to the other eye. So I, you know, debated all the, so back to, you know, I could do a Fodden to kind of restrict him, but that wouldn't help so much with the torsion. I could do this small recess resect procedure, um, which could also help with the torsion. Um, but I could also do a, you know, a superior oblique tuck that would, would, would help more with the torsion. The other part of his case that's, you know, um, a little bit interesting is that he's got this schwannoma and there is, you know, um, there, these are rare diseases, uh, rare tumors. Um, they're usually benign, slow growing, you know, to pop up in the fourth to sixth decade of life. Um, and they don't, you know, I looked at looking at the neurosurgical literature. Um, even when people do have surgery, they still have that fourth nerve palsy. So it's not like you can make that better by, by intervening. Um, a big uh, review or a big study done by Nancy Newman looked at these and they really, you know, the neuro ophthalmology community, uh, community does not recommend doing surgery for these unless they become very big and start to cause other compression. Um, this looked at 30 patients where only three underwent neurosurgery. Obviously, if you look at the neurosurgical literature, they're looking more at their people who underwent surgery and had outcomes. Also, it's interesting that only six had strabismus surgery. And, and sometimes that's just because it can be hard to kind of fix. And, um, and some, some surgeons are um, hesitant to do surgery sometimes for these misalignments only in one position of gaze. But um, uh, they do not recommend doing any kind of surgery. But you do know that if you do do surgery for him, um, just in talking to when I reached out to Dave Hunter and also when I talked to Dave Dries and just some of these uh, other page, other uh, of my mentors who have dealt with more of these patients that you can do one surgery and it will hold for a little while, but it often gets worse. And so um, those are all things that I had to take into account when deciding what to do the, for these uh, this case. And we love doing adult strabismus because um, it's often very rewarding, but it, it, it often takes, it, it does take a lot more time and you're weighing many more um, consequences and, uh, uh, risks when you, when you decide what kind of surgery to do. So I decided to do a tuck. Um, uh, but I was also nervous that I didn't want to overdo him on a tuck because he's got this big trip coming up. And if I do too much of a tuck, it's going to make him worse in up gaze, which is a bicycle trip. So, um, that also made me a little bit nervous, but I also had to think about the long-term approach. And if this is just going to get worse, what am I going to do later? So I decided that I would start with the tuck and see how he does and then, um, uh, watch him and, and see if it gets worse over time, which, you know, there isn't a whole lot of literature on it, but, uh, discussing it with other colleagues, it sounds like they often do, and you're going to need to do something later. And then you can go after the inferior rectus later to try to help with them. But uh, in talking to Dave, Dave had a very similar case, almost pretty much the same. So it's also a 50 year old guy with a history of diplopia, began intermittently and worsened. He didn't have any history of um, 
uh, you know, trauma or anything like that. And his symptoms were worse just below the horizon or, you know, just as he started to go into down gaze because it starts to split there and, and turn and, and the torsion gets worse that way. But it was really affecting driving and reading and, and, and making things tricky. Um, he had a scan done that showed a, um, a schwannoma as well. Um, and like my patient, he didn't have very much in down in straight ahead gaze, but had a lot in down gaze and a lot more in this field of gaze of the superior oblique muscle. Also had, you know, more torsion in down gaze. Not a whole lot of torsion though overall, but that also tells you that it probably isn't a bilateral uh, problem either. He seemed to have a little bit more, uh, um, inferior oblique overaction, I think. And this line seems to look up just, he's also a left side. This one just looks up just a little bit more when he looks that way. Um, he seems to have more of a X, you know, not as much of an, uh, um, esotropy and looking down gaze, but you can see that this muscle, this eye really doesn't pull down as much as this one does. Uh, so Dave also opted to do a tuck. He did a six millimeter tuck, which isn't a huge tuck. It was just about the same I did. When I did go on the in on the muscle, it wasn't really floppy. It was actually seemed to have some, you know, seemed to be working. I think it still had some power, um, which also makes you worry that it's going to get worse over time. Um, and after that, he did some force duction testing where he makes, you know, make sure he ties this in with a bow tie and then pulls, you know, moves the eye and sees what the restriction is and usually calls it good when it's you get some restriction at what, as the inferior limbus crosses the horizontal midline. Postoperatively, he looked you know much better. He's a little overdone in primary, got a little bit of a browns, still a little underdone when he looks down here. Um, but I'm sure uh, you know now he's got a little bit of in cyclotorsion, but you're putting a suture on a paralytic muscle and it's probably going to um, loosen a little bit over time. Two years later, he came back and um, has this back again. So this is kind of what I'm anticipating for my patient. Um, and now the question is, now what can you do? It's really hard to go back on a talk. You don't want to have to do that. So he decided to do the same small recess resect procedure of that inferior rectus to try to make it a little bit like a fodden so it's restricted in down gaze. Um, and this is a follow-up about six months later where he still looks great and Dave hasn't heard from him since. So, um, you know, these are pretty rare cases. There aren't too many, you know, series looking at them, but it looks like a very similar course. But the other thing that I thought was really interesting about this case was I kind of felt like I overthought it a lot because he was a neurologist and I felt like he was in our field and he had some knowledge of, of how muscles work and how brain tumors work and how to treat that and sometimes worry that you know, maybe he knows more than I do or, um, and he was actually very good about deferring to me in terms of the strabismus. But, um, you know, there is some literature about this that sometimes we think differently about different patients. And sometimes those who are physicians may get different care because we're thinking differently and don't treat them um, the same. And, and it may influence our behavior. Um, you know, our quality of care may be inferior because we, you know, deviate from our common practices. And, um, you know, th there's not a whole lot of literature. I think it's hard to do studies on this, but I know soon after practice, one of my med school castmates came and brought his daughter to me and she had an intermittent exotropia and I did surgery and I hung this, I hung the laterals back. And a couple of days later she had, an, she was overcorrected and he was like, I can't leave her cross-eyed. She was so much better before. You can't do this. You can't do this. And, you know, and I, I let him talk me into it. And I went back and I pulled the muscles up and she quickly went XT again. And, and, um, I, I feel like sometimes we don't treat these patients the same and our care, um, deviates. And, um, I don't know. I think we always just need to be aware of that. Um, I, that's a case always sticks in my mind, but when somebody comes in and they say, Oh, they're a patient, a neurologist with uh, diplopia, you kind of, you know, think a little bit differently about it. And that's why I kind of ran cases, you know, this case past other people just to make sure I was doing what was right. But, um, sometimes I feel like maybe you would underdo him cause you really didn't want to overdo him. And, and maybe I should have been a little bit more aggressive on his tuck, but, um, no, I just think that's another interesting point that, that certainly changes, you know, it's sometimes the same with people, you know, too, um, you treat them differently and you deviate from your standard of care. And it's, it's also a question I always have when I go to the hospital, like, do I tell them I'm a doctor? It's probably better not to, because I think you get better care if you just are treated like everybody else, because that's how their habit is. But um, I don't know. It's just kind of an interesting 
part of our job. Um, but thanks so much for listening. I know torsion isn't always the topic, but it is a topic that you guys see on your boards and things, and it can be very annoying for people, and it can be hard in clinic when you see these patients and they don't seem to have a whole lot of misalignment, but they're complaining and you're wondering if it's all in their head or not. But um, we love to see these patients, even if they don't have anything and, and, and rule out a problem. But if they've got a double vision that gets better when they close one eye, send them our way. Yeah, Bob. No, he had an he had a uh, he had a schwannoma too. I just didn't. So yes, he had, yeah, he had a scan and showed a schwannoma. So it's the exact same thing, and and it just got worse. You know, and it, he fixed him, and then it got worse over time, which is what I'm worried about with my with my patient. But also, why I kind of staged the procedure, and he knows that it's probably going to get worse again. These are difficult cases where you've got incompetence for business, you've got torsion, and torsion is something we have difficulty dealing with still. And getting it, you know, entirely resolved. It's a tough issue, um, and we may not think so. I mean, unless you're the patient that has it, um, and then it dramatically interferes with your ability to function. So this is good to talk about, especially older people too. I feel like it kind of screws with their mental state too when they can't. And I, you know, I had similar experience with a patient who was a uh, chairman of plastic surgery at a uh, very local famous institution. Um, who had progressive diplopia, and I watched him over many years before operating on him because of his position, and I knew that if things didn't go well, it would be a issue. You know, so yes, I think that we do have to kind of juggle things in terms of some of the patients that we see, that we know, have to work with, um, and I offered him the option, that patient, of of sending him elsewhere, and he um, very vigorously declined, um, much to my chagrin, because I was hoping he'd go away and come back fixed. Hopefully, are. Yeah, Dave. Just a quick comment. Many of our strabismus surgeries, we're looking for a small overcorrection that can induce double vision, that can cause eyes that were in the beginning going out to be crossed. And when parents see that, they panic. But we like that. It's a pretty hard sell for parents. And when you have someone who's a VIP, it's even tougher. Like with a tuck, I would want to induce Brown syndrome up front because tucks unwind. Yeah, and that's my problem too. I maybe underdid him a little bit, but yeah, I have also, you know, I'm hesitant to overdo him and have him be mad at me, but he also has this trip upcoming, but yeah, but he also is aware that it's gonna come back. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I would probably like a little bit more in that case, but I was, I, I was also timid on my tuck. Yeah, actually, I think you nailed it. And uh, I, I wasn't really thinking about your patient, Amy, as much as the, the, the childhood XT that she talked about. Yeah, where, you want that to be, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so frustrating. It's so hard for people to understand. Now their eyes are crossing. They've made my child worse. It's, it's a really tough thing. It's, it's yeah. Awesome especially when they live far away and you can only, you know, he, so that also creates another issue, but all these things you have to weigh. Um, and you all, we all have similar situations in the different medicine we do. I'll let you know how he does after faculty club. I see him there every month. Three. He's really happy for now. He's thrilled about his trip. But... So good morning, everybody. Can you do that? Uh, I'm Dave Dries. Uh, we're talking about extorsion today. Extorsion stinks. It's a, it's a terrible symptom. And um, this gives you an idea. One of my patients who uh, had to have, oh, by the way, everyone can hear me okay, right? It's not too loud. You're okay. Okay. Um, one of my patients with torsion uh, was a photographer and sent me this series of photos of what her life was like at her apartment complex with torsion. And I think this photo really says it all. That's imagine trying to go up and down those stairs. So torsional diploma is really tough and uh, surgery is the only treatment. We don't have prison for this, of course. Uh, and uh, But if anyone can figure out a non-surgical treatment for torsion, I think they're going to do really well in life if they can get that intellectual property. Uh, so 
I'm just going to talk about the surgical procedures to help with extorsion, mainly in superior oblique paresis. And there's, there's a theme in these cases. All of them have a neurologic cause of their extorsion and superior oblique paresis. That's very typical that you need to address extorsion surgically with neurologic caused superior oblique paresis. If it's congenital, it's much less of an issue. So this is the case that Mimi just presented. And I'll just say this gentleman, he didn't have much torsion uh, and a tuck worked great to help him with that torsion. In fact, he had in torsion, I don't know, 48 hours after surgery. And he had two degrees of in, in torsion that uh, he could fuse after his talk months later. Uh, hey, Ethan, can you help me with the menu there up on the top? I don't know how to get rid of that. Um, and that last patient that, that Mimi presented that I just showed you had a significant amount of hypertropia from the superior oblique paresis. Here's a patient who does not have that, does not have much hypertropia with their superior oblique paresis. As you can see here, only one, two, di what, two diopters of left hypertropia, builds to seven with near fixation, and even not much in down gaze. But look at the torsion. There's a huge amount of torsion, eight degrees uh, in primary gaze, and then in down gaze, 15 total degrees of extorsion. So this is a rare uh, presentation, but it's, it's a perfect setup for the next surgical procedure for extorsion, the Harada Ito. Not a talk, the Harada Ito. And the goal of the Harada Ito is only to correct extorsion. It leaves the vertical position of the eye alone. And what we do is we, here's the superior oblique tendon in the right eye. And this is the superior rectus here, medial rectus here, lateral rectus here. So surgically, what we do is split the tendon in half and we take a, about a half of the tendon, a third of the tendon, some a quarter of the tendon and move it uh, anteriorly on the globe to about eight millimeters posterior to the insertion of the lateral rectus. And in essence, what that does is these fibers have more intorting effect on the globe than if they're where uh, they started when this patient was born. So we leave these posterior fibers alone. The main function of the posterior fibers of the superior bleak are depression. Okay. So kind of makes sense here. Great procedure when you don't have much vertical deviation, you don't need to correct vertical deviation, but you have tons of torsion here. So this is an old procedure. This has been around a long time. We know it works clinically, just empirically it works. But more recently, about nine years ago, Joe Deemer found out that the superior uh, oblique muscle actually has two discrete compartments based on where the trochlear nerve divides inside of the muscle. Half of the nerve goes to a medial compartment and the other half of the nerve goes to a lateral compartment. It turns out the medial compartment is attached to the anterior tendon and the lateral compartment is attached to the posterior tendon histologically in the muscle. So maybe, we this isn't proven, but maybe patients like this one that only have torsion and not much of a vertical deviation has something wrong with that division to the medial compartment only of the superior oblique. So it's a rare thing, but it's not proven, but it sure looks like that's what's going on. Well, two weeks post-op, her torsion is much better just two degrees uh, in uh, primary gaze and six in down gaze. And here are measurements, which are pretty much unchanged for her vertical deviation. And she can fuse this residual torsion. Okay. Superior Blake Tuck, Harada Ito. Here's the third procedure. A nasal transposition of the inferior rectus. Well, how does this work mechanically? And what are we doing? Well, this is the right eye. Here are the recti muscles, the lateral rectus, medial rectus, superior rectus. Here's the inferior rectus. And this has been detached from the globe. 
and shifted nasally. So when this muscle pulls, it intorts the globe to correct extorsion. Here's what it looks like intraoperatively. Here and here, that's where the muscle was attached to the globe where this forcep is attached. And here is the inferior rectus. This is surgeon's view. You're looking at the right eye surgeon's view. So the nose is over here. Uh, the uh, left eye is over here. The eyebrow, the right eye is here. And this muscle is moved in that direction. And that's going to intort the globe in this direction to correct extorsion. So here's a woman, less superior oblique priestess. Interesting, she fixed with the palsied eye, which happens. It gets a little confusing for us in the clinic to sort out exactly what's going on. Um, and again, this is neurologic stroke. And here she is. She's looking with her palsied eye with the left eye down. That's unusual, but it happens. And what happens over time if your eye is stuck down? The inferior rectus gets tight. The inferior rectus is in a, uh, uh, it just shortens over time. Think of it that way. And so this patient in the operating, well, let me back up. So she has lots of torsion too. Uh, 12 degrees of excyclo in primary gaze and 16 in down gaze. And uh, when I took her to the operating room, I thought maybe we could do a tuck. A tuck might work, but in the operating room, the four ductions were positive for restriction of her contralateral inferior rectus. So, oh, rats. Um, look, when she tries to look into up gaze, this eye just doesn't go up. And if I put forceps on it, when she's under general anesthesia and try to pull it up, it won't come up. So I knew that muscle needed to be recessed. Um, and uh, so this is a surgery, five millimeter uh, inferior rectus recession, the tight muscle, letting that go, putting it back, but then a nasal transposition of the inferior rectus on the contralateral eye to correct her extorsion. And here she is immediately post-operatively. She has no torsion. And um, she actually is a little bit overcorrected. This is 48 hours. And again, that same theme. We want patients in many cases a little bit overcorrected. And here she is nine months later. She's fusing and her torsion is gone. Um, one final procedure I'll mention. Uh, this is more uh, kind of fellow level and for our attendings, but if, if you understand this, then I'd be really happy if you're a technician, medical student, resident. So Herring's Law, Herring's Law. What is Herring's Law? Anyone know? Any of the medical students or residents want to tell me what that is? No? Okay. Herring's Law is... Yoke muscles receive bilateral simultaneous innervation. Okay. So this is easiest to understand with my right medial rectus and my left lateral rectus pulling together. They pull equally so that my eyes point at the same thing when I look to the left. These two muscles are yoke muscles. That's true for vertical muscles, cyclovertical muscles as well. The superior oblique has a yoke muscle on the opposite eye. And it's the inferior rectus, which makes sense because they're both depressors. Does that make sense to everybody? I don't see much nodding, but that <laughs> good. <laughs> I appreciate the nodding. Uh, so if you, if you have that concept straight, that the yoke muscle of the superior oblique is the other eye inferior rectus and they get bilateral simultaneous innervation, then you crack the code to why the following procedure works. <coughs> I apologize, still getting over something. Uh, this is a patient with, uh, after neurosurgery, I can't remember a tumor, I think, uh, developed uh, bilateral superior oblique paresis. And she has a huge amount of extorsion in primary gaze, the total is 20, down gaze, 25. That's very typical for bilateral superior paresis. They typically don't have 
much deviation in primary gaze, but their hypertropia reverses in side gazes. And you can see that happening in these photos. Here's a right hypertropia, here's a left hypertropia. They develop a big esotropia and down gaze too. Well, she underwent a tuck and uh, the tuck uh, I showed you before in the photo, this is just a video to show you the end point of the tuck. We want Brown syndrome. That eye doesn't go up at that point. It should go up higher with, with no surgery done on it. So having a bit of a Brown syndrome is, is, is what we're after. And uh, afterwards, she was fusing in primary gaze pretty well, but she still had diplopia and down gaze. She still had a lot of excyclotorsion in down gaze. So her double vision, her torsional double vision in particular was better looking straight ahead, but if she looked down, she would get the torsional double vision. Well, how did that tuck work? We just, well, we strengthened the superior oblique. We shortened the tendon, right? The muscle doesn't pull as hard as it's supposed to, but if we shorten the tendon, that reduced innervation is enough to get the eye straight, looking straight ahead. Is there any way we can get it to pull harder? And the answer is to recess the yoke muscles on each eye. So for example, if I want my superior oblique to pull hard, if I recess the inferior rectus on the opposite eye, well, the brain says, I have to put more innervation into the recessed inferior rectus to get the eye in a proper position. And by Herring's law, that shoots innervation right down to the superior oblique on the opposite eye. So she had, uh, the surgery that she had was uh, bilateral inferior rectus recession and by the way, I won't go through this, but she had adequate talks. After 12. Um, and, uh, and here she is postoperatively. Her extorsion is much better in down gaze. Went from about, what was it, 18 post-op or 16 now it's at uh, uh, eight. And this seven degrees of extorsion, she can fuse in primary gaze. And she can look down about 15 degrees into down gaze. And beyond that, she does develop extorsion, but she has this range of gaze that will allow her to drive and look at a phone. She doesn't, she doesn't have to do this when she's looking down at things. So that's one more way of helping extorsion in this unique situation with bilateral superior oblique precess. I'll stop there. I hope you understood that. I know some of it's a little bit difficult and uh, any questions? All right. I know that was very interesting, but also a lot as a, as a trainee, I felt like that was when I was listening to a similar talk by Dr. Dries as a resident, I definitely felt overwhelmed. That's okay. You can still become a pediatric ophthalmologist. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of switch uh, themes here to uh, a NICU consult that I had that was kind of interesting to me. So I, I love pediatric ophthalmology because of the range of things that we get to see all the way from interesting and complex adult strabismus. Um, to interesting developmental anomalies and genetic conditions that we are exposed to in, in, in our work every day. So this NICU consult, um, we actually, just as a background to that, we actually cover, our division covers three different NICUs currently with the help of our residents. And sometimes NICU consults are added onto our ROP list for the week. So we cover the university uh, NICU, uh, the primary children's NICU in Salt Lake City and the primary children's NICU in Lehigh as well. So I'll talk about the case presentation. We'll talk about the pathophysiology of the disease, the mystery disease, and then we'll talk about a few takeaways. So this was the consult. Uh, it said, please evaluate for possible septo-optic dysplasia, which is a very common consult that we get from the NICU. And oftentimes it's not that interesting, like we don't really find anything, or it's kind of hard to diagnose optic nerve hypoplasia in a newborn, but uh, we always take a look. 
So there was a seven day old girl we were consulted on. She was born at 41 weeks gestational age and her birth weight, birth weight was just over three kilograms. She already had a significant, she already had significant findings in her past medical history. She had congenital renal anomalies, a tethered cord, absent septum pellucidum. These, some, some of these findings were actually found on her prenatal MRI. So we knew that there was, when she was born, that there were gonna be other findings that we were gonna be looking for. Uh, at day of life one, she was actually found to have seizure-like activity. And by the time I saw her, she'd already had video EEGs and was diagnosed with seizures by the neurology uh, department. She, already, she also had uterus didelphus. Whole genome sequencing was, after I did this consult, she, it was eventually uh, completed and the, the rapid um, WGS was negative. And there was no family history of ocular and neurologic diseases. This is what information we had ahead of time. So her imaging showed there's something going on here in the um, posterior globes. It looks like, looks like a little bit of outpouching if you follow our arrow signs and could be maybe a coloboma, maybe coloboma is an optic disc. You can also tell here that there's something that's just not normal here in the brain as well. So here are some findings that I, um, I guess, what was that? That I've marked out for us to easily go through. Uh, she was found to have an absent corpus callosum. So that's right here in the blue. She had polymicrogyria. So these little gyri are just a, a lot more tightly packed and more numerous than you'd expect. And she also had dandy walker malformation. So there's a posterior fossa enlargement and some cerebellar tissue missing actually. Her right hemisphere is larger than her left and her left side has like a larger, like more ventricular megaly as well. Uh, on my exam, I found that she had right upper lid ptosis. It was a complete ptosis. She couldn't spontaneously open her lid, even with good frontalis engagement. I also saw that she had this horizontal jerk nystagma. Sometimes it was right beating, sometimes left beating, kind of moderate amplitude and frequency. And she didn't have a great, on her vision exam, didn't have a great response to light. She would sort of intermittently blink to the light with each eye. She had normal, normal anterior segment exams. But when I looked in the backs of her eyes, this is what... I found. And these are uh, great photographs taken by our ROP coordinator, Mal Chandler, who is just somehow is amazing at taking pictures of, of newborn babies. And there are quite a few findings here that are interesting. So on the right eye, this optic nerve doesn't look totally normal. It just kind of looks larger than average. Maybe it has a little hole in the middle. Maybe this optic nerve also does, doesn't look completely normal. Uh, I looked a little bit deep in the middle on like stereoscopic view, stereoscopic view, excuse me. And there are these little hypopigmented lesions throughout the um, posterior pole. And the fundus itself looked like maybe it was pretty like light color, like a blonde fundus, but there are areas of hyperpigmentation too. So I was like, I don't know exactly what these are, but I had a few ideas. Here's some um, uh, images of like just some more peripheral sweeps of that left eye. So you can kind of think about what this is. You can either shout it out, uh, just a few options here. Uh, what are these hypopigmented lesions? Are, are they chorioretinal colobomas, chirpy, lacunae, morning glory disc anomaly? Or you can whisper to your neighbor or keep it a secret to yourself. I um, had a few different ideas, but I had to call a friend. So I called Dr. Wong and she told me what these were. Lacunae. So lacuna, it, the singular, the lacuna is like a gap or a space. And lacunae is the plural, it's Latin, apparently. Um, and it's a thinning of the choroid and sclera. There's depigmentation or hypopigmentation of the RPE. There's rod cone degeneration in those spaces. And the lesion is at the level of the retina. These lesions can be white when they're around the optic disc and they're kind of in the periphery, they look more pinkish. And you can have a few pigment deposits around the, the lesions themselves, just as, as we see in this patient. But when we're comparing it to other conditions, it's kind of important to think about how is this different from these other more probably more common uh, anomalies that we see. So, what is how is a how are lacunae different from chorioretinal colobomas? So, in this case, this is a picture of chorioretinal coloboma from Rancor, and you can see how even the vessels here kind of track around the coloboma and they kind of don't cross over. So, you can tell that this lesion is is involving the retina itself, whereas these vessels kind of uh, of the retina just kind of track over. Um, the lesion here. And the pathophysiology is different. So in a choroidal, choroidal coloboma or choroidal coloboma, there is failure of closure of the embryonic fissure. So the choroid and the RP don't develop normally. So the outer retina doesn't develop. And the inner retina can still be there, a few layers of that, and that can form little breaks in it that can then result in a retinal detachment. 
is also different from morning glory disc anomaly. So morning glory is also a different pathophysiology. In this case, uh, there's not an embryonic fissure issue, but like mesodermal cell di differentiation problems. So the sclera doesn't form properly. And then the what, what tissue remains of the retina and the optic nerve sort of out pouch kind of fall back a little bit because the sclera is kind of thin. Uh, there are different types of morning glory disc anomalies. This is just one picture that can look like multiple different things if you, if you Google it. Um, there are some cases in which there is some RPE left over, also telling us that the embryonic fissure did close in, this pa in, in these patients. And then, of course, there's chirpy as well. So chirpy does have these little lesions that look kind of similar to these lacunae. And actually, these lesions within the chirpy are also called lacunae. Um, because these are also at the level of the retina. And you can see the vessels kind of track over just like they do uh, in these lacunae lesions. But chirpy, of course, uh, looks a bit different. This is not usually centered around the posterior polar optic disc, usually a little bit more in the periphery. And um, they can look like multiple different things. They can have the lacunae or not have the lacunae. And usually benign, except, of course, when they're associated with um, familial adenomatous polyposis. So chorioretinal lacunae are pathognomonic for this condition called Icardi syndrome, which is what our patient has. And again, if I expand a little bit more on lacunae, because I just this is kind of like the main takeaway from this talk. So lacunae, um, again, at the level of the retina, they are usually largest at around the optic disc and posterior pole, and they get a little bit smaller as they go into the periphery. And they, they can be different sizes, anywhere between one-tenth of a disc diameter to several disc diameters. But there isn't an increase in size over time. So as you can see in this patient, in this case report, at one year and at five years, the size of the lacunae stays the same, but the periphery of, of, the, of each lacunae has increased pigmentation around it, which is normal. So the differential of Icardi syndrome includes the conditions I have listed here. However, these are kind of like distant, dif distantly related conditions, as in like it's actually quite... Uh, Icardi syndrome is actually quite straightforward in its diagnosis because it has several features and diagnostic criteria that these conditions do not meet. So we'll talk about those in just a minute. The epidemiology of the disease is that it's pre it's equally prevalent in all races. Uh, it is actually really, really rare though. So the incidence in the United States is listed here in Europe is a little bit more common, but I was trying to figure out like what other disease is similar in incidence. And I was like just looking up a few different diseases, typing in these different incidences. And things that came up were propionic aciduria, some other rare urea, urea, meta or urea um, diseases, essentially, or met metabolic diseases as well. So super, super rare. The mean survival is unfortunately really low, only about eight years. And the median survival is eight, only 18.5 years. And the survival really depends on how severe the seizures are in these patients. The classic triad that was described back in 1965 by Icardi was that there should be agenesis of the corpus callosum, there should be um, central or posterior polar chorioretinal lacunae, and infantile spasms, which are a type of seizure that occurs in babies or infants less than one year old. The modified diagnostic criteria has a lot other a lot of a lot of other features that sort of expanded this the clinical diagnosis here. So, like our patient, you can have polymicrogyria as well. There can be cysts um, in, around the ventricle choroid plexus, and the majority of these patients also have some optic nerve anomaly, including a coloboma or hypoplasia. And then there's some other supporting features that can be found, such as uh, scoliosis from vertebral and rib anomalies. Um, and microphthalmia, split brain EEG, which kind of tells you that there's a corpus callosum lesion. And you can have hemispheric asymmetry as our patient had as well. Interestingly though, the genetic cause of this hasn't been identified. So there isn't a specific gene or set of genes that are associated with this condition. In a lot of the studies that you read or just summaries of this of this disease, people talk about how there must be some sort of de novo, de novo pathogenic variant on a gene that is on the X chromosome because this is possibly lethal in males and it only presents in females, but there isn't a specific gene again. And even the idea that it's lethal in males has been contested in some of these genetic studies that are coming out. Um, there's no parent to child transmission and you can counsel patients that the recurrence risk to siblings is less than 1%. I thought this was an interesting study where this is the 
area of emerging research in, in Icardi syndrome, where we're trying to find the actual cause of this condition, because you need to find a cause if we're going to try to figure out how to treat it or, or um, fix it or help people get through it. And uh, in this case, or in this uh, case series, they looked at 10 girls with Icardi syndrome uh, based on the modified clinical criteria. And in five of those patients, they did find some de novo variants in these five genes. And they did some in vivo assays, and they found that two of these genes, when they were um, put into mice, these knockout mutations, there was some restriction of their cortical development in a clinically relevant way. So there must be some sort of molecular pathway going on, they, they say in this study, uh, that's causing some abnormality of cortical development here. The management of the disease really just has to do, at this point, because again, we don't know the exact cause, um, managing the findings that we see. So helping patients, uh, you know, treat them for infantile spasms and seizures, help them with their multiple developmental delays, with physical, occupational, and speech therapy, a lot of these kids have poor feeding, so encouraging um, and maintaining good nutritional counseling and monitoring their growth is important. And then because they can get scoliosis, you know, uh, helping their musculoskeletal growth is also important. Um, and then potential hospice care, because this can be a very um, uh, short-lived uh, uh, experience for, for these patients, unfortunately. So back to our patient, unfortunately, I don't have good news about her case. I did see her in clinic after I saw her in the NICU. She was not doing very well. She was um, having breakthrough seizures, even on three different anti-epileptic medications and was also put on a fourth as a rescue. And that resulted in her just being awake for about three hours a day at the most. And during that those waking periods, she continued to have those seizures. Um, and she unfortunately did not survive. So I just found out like when I was looking at her chart a couple of days ago that she did pass away, unfortunately. Um, but this is an important case to be aware of because it really required a multidisciplinary approach to come up with this diagnosis. The neurologists and the ophthalmologists had to definitely work together to, to figure out that this was Icardi syndrome. So our takeaways are that um, chorea retinal lacunae are centered around the optic disc, that are, that are centered around the optic disc are pathognomonic for Icardi syndrome. And this is a clinical diagnosis, not a genetic diagnosis. And for everyone out there, you should really consider doing uh, pediatric ophthalmology. If you don't like pediatric ophthalmology, do neuro-ophthalmology, at least do uveitis. Okay, we all need you. <laughs> Take any questions. Right. Yes. <laughs> Great presentation. I've seen maybe 10, 12 kids with acardies in the last four years. Oh. Um, and you're spot on. The issue is seizure control. Mm -hmm. And for those with uncontrolled seizures, they don't make it to school age. Mm -hmm. Those that are partially controlled don't make it to double digits. And I've never had an Acardi's patient make it to an age where I pass them off to our adult colleagues. Mm -hmm. You know, it is unfortunately a, a really bad situation. And our neurologists work overtime with these kids trying to get seizures controlled. But as a group, they have been very very difficult. And this is one of those diagnoses. You see those lacunae, you know, it, it you know, a, a cardi. And, and now your patient had absent septum pollicinum, not agenesis corpus callosum. Both. I had both. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I'm not seeing it without agenesis corpus callosum. Tom Williams, when he was in practice in town, he presented a patient at APOS. He had photographic evidence of a kid with acardies where he thought that the lacunae were progressive. Oh, so really? One K, and I've, I've not seen that replicated or discussed anywhere else. Um, so I think it's pretty much believed that they're not, but he was adamant and he had photos of a child. He'd done serial exams under anesthesia trying to figure out what was going on with the child, but he thought that they had progressed. Interesting. So it might be the kid had something else. He might have been the first person to look here for me. Uh, that's probably the case. He was very meticulous. Very meticulous. Anyway, great presentation. Yeah, Thank you for sharing your experience. It's it's definitely hard to see what the parents have to go through with dealing with the first. It's really difficult diagnosis. Um, the hospice nurse actually came to the visit with the mom because there's so much information and figuring out how to you know, put into perspective of her goals of life, which was just to have her at home. That was their main goal and, and try to have enjoy as much time with her as they could. And we see these kids in this little narrow slice of time mm -hmm. clinic or in the NICU. And those parents are living that 
24-7 for as long as that child's alive. And, you know, God bless them. Um, there was, uh, in the literature, there's one case of a 34-year-old that I saw. But, of course, that's super, super rare. Um, <laughs> wasn't here. Yeah. Um, I see a comment here. So it says from Teresa. Uh, so Rob, I saw a case of this when I was a resident through the ED at PCH. The patient was older, but we uh, we were consulted because she wasn't tracking and having seizures and spasms. So yeah, definitely um, something to look out for when you hear um, infantile seizures as well. It's so looking for other optic nerve, retinal, choroidal abnormalities. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, Sometimes you can see those colobomas that almost look like lacuna, but they're always in that infranasal, you know, the cleft. So coloboma is always going to be in that same spot too. So these lacunae, you're going to see it, even though they go around the nerves, they're not going to be in that. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see a little circle that's like a little bit of a coloboma, but they're also going to be in normal. You know, these kids are here developmentally normal but you know you can see little things that almost look like a lacunae but they're always yeah. along that intro temporal infra temporal infranasal sorry infranasal uh, that's what i thought at first it's like, oh, it's like are these infranasal or are these little colobomas but when you yeah when you look at that it's just the shape of these are different and layers aren't bothered uh, Rob, right at this uh ball three of the optic nerve is a tiny little brain for a retina in yeah. yeah. that if you saw that in was interior would be kind of the quintessential you know lesion for kids something else with developmental delay and things around the optic nerve which should be charged mm -hmm. uh charge syndrome shows up with those tiny colobomas that look but they don't look like this usually you know they're they're still different and they tend to obey those same guidelines because in that it's I think in charge, I believe it's still, you know, failure of the embryonic fissure yeah. flows causes those cold mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Exactly. They won't have those cerebral Right. Yeah. And they're usually not seizing, they just have yeah. issues causing developmental delay. Yeah. And there are airway issues. Yeah, when you see um optic nerve colobomas, yes, also have to think about PAC six mutations and checking for renal anomalies or checking for that mutation at least. Go ahead. You know if this condition can ever be detected in vitro? Yeah, that's a really good question because it actually cannot because you have to be able to see the optic or the ocular findings, but you can see some of these precursor um, findings that we discussed. So when the patient even presented uh, to us, the prenatal um, MRI did show that there was like an absent septum and that there were, there was maybe just not complete or normal development of the cerebellum. Um, so there were findings that were concerning for that something else to be going on here. And usually when we see something in the brain, like a midline lesion like that, an absent septum, they usually consult us almost automatically, um, for looking for the mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. What's like the ultimate goal of your care um, when the morbidity and like this prognosis is so severe? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, uh, when the patient came and saw me in clinic because there was a hospice nurse present, it was kind of helped us engage in a conversation about what are the goals of care and how can I be helpful? Mom, I just asked mom to let me know how much information do you wanna know about her ocular conditions and the different findings? And how much detail do you want me to go into explaining those? So just kind of asking permission of what, what you know, to, without overwhelming her and being too negative about all the different anomalies and concerns about visual development going on. She wanted to know everything. She wanted to know exactly how you would treat like the uh, right upper lid ptosis as well, all the way to like what kind of vision can someone have with um, optic nerve coloboma. So um, it really depends on the family, I think, and, and what they want to know and do. And I asked, like, when would you like to see me again? Or would you like me to suggest the timeline for follow-up? Things like that. And I was like, do you want to see ocular plastics for the right upper lithosis? So I, because mom was enthusiastic, we did kind of go through all of the potential treatment options and things. Yeah, I had one of these cases, too, where I, I'm sure I've been really dependent on the family. So... Uh... The kid was on my Gabatran, which several years ago, we were supposed to see them every three months for them to keep getting the medication. But the mom said to me, like, she's got no vision. We're never going to take her off this medication. I don't really want to keep seeing you because you don't have anything to you know, help me with here. 
you can't, I, I'm just not going to come and see you anymore. And I, I think that, and she wasn't rude about it, but I, I think you have to have that conversation with them. So sometimes, yeah, there's not much for us to do visually and it's just another visit, but some people still like to come see you and have you reassure them. So I think it totally depends on the family um, in that regard. The other thing that's helpful at times is to be able to provide accurate information to OTPT early intervention, you know, support folks about what the child can see so that they can realistically plan what they're going to do. Because these kids do live often for a number of years, depending on their ability to control the seizures. And part of the goal of treatment is to try to make their life as, you know, nice and comfortable and meaningful as possible in the time they've got. And so that's, I think what I've looked at that is trying to gather information and pass that on. That's a tough issue with bigabitrin with no vision. I mean, if they get retinal toxicity, you know, yeah. is it going to make a difference? No. So yeah. that mom was spot on. Yeah, she just, yes. she said, we're never going to put on this man. So I, I don't, why do I need to come see you? Well, I said, if you don't, I'll still sign your form. Just send them along. Yeah. Another thought on that ptosis, it could be that that kid had microphthalmia because in a lot of these cases where they have like coloboma or lacuna or stuff, the eyes aren't formed right. And so sometimes that eye is smaller and it's just that the eye doesn't open. You know, I've had some referrals where it's ptosis and it's actually just that the eye is small and doesn't open. So yeah. that's, that's another. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming to our Grand Rounds. <laughs>